I think it would be helpful to have just a very quick discussion about friction and springs, in particular sort of as it relates to forces. In the next chapter or next section of the chapter 3b of the book Mary McCraig, we'll talk about work energy and we'll talk a little bit more about friction and springs, but this is helpful, I think, hopefully, in terms of how we define the terms that are there and also how we look at uh, what the physics of this are, or physics of these are. Um, so first of all, define friction related to the springs we use in, these, in this course and define their characteristics. Um, Charles Augustin de Coulomb is one of the first people to measure forces between two surfaces. And you can kind of see the, the very complex device he had developed. You know, you can measure the force over here and you have uh, a, a tray or something that you want to put on there. You can vary that tray, put wheels on it, put various types of weights on it and various types of interfaces. But one of the interesting things that comes out of this is that we have a tendency in this course to sort of look at things from the macroscopic uh, point of view. So you have a box up here and you have a floor here and you put a force. And we sort of say, look, there's a friction force. But really what's happening is that microscopically you have a lot of roughness elements. So you can see here, for example, this is from a paper, static friction of fractal interfaces, uh, that when you put one object on top of another, dependent on what the surfaces are like, you're going to have uh, different types of results. So we end up with a model, and that model is that force of friction goes as some mu times the normal force. And You've already done probably a couple examples in this, and you've seen some examples in the various lectures. When two objects slide relative to one another, that coefficient changes from a general mu to mu sub k. When the two objects do not slide relative to one another, then it's coefficient of static friction. So we, we're gonna end up with three cases, but ultimately what's really important for you to understand about friction is that it acts to oppose relative motion or the tendency of relative motion between objects in contact. So we have three cases. Uh, so here I've done a very simple diagram. Uh, again, this is a free body diagram and I have should sort of put mu sub n, mu sub s, k or whatever that's going to oppose motion. We'll have three different cases. The objects do not move or do not slip or do not slide relative to one another. Then friction force is going to be a magnitude. I'm just going to give it as a magnitude that is less than or equal to the static coefficient of friction uh, times the normal force. Now that coefficient or that, that friction value does not go to a maximum. So it, it can be anything and you determine that from your free body diagrams. And you did this in sort of Civ 100. With impending slip, then you have the two bodies are just about to go. Then the force of friction is equal to the coefficient of static friction times normal. Force of friction always opposes motion. So if you push in the direction of, or in, if you push, sorry, if I push in this direction, then the friction force is going to oppose. Then finally, when two bodies slide relative to one another, then the friction force on body A due to body B is again going to be force of friction times mu n, but the difference is it's k now. So it goes from a static friction to a k uh, kinetic friction. So as you solve these problems, that's what you have to realize. So how do you solve these problems? Generally, the first thing you do is you assume no slip and then check. And once you do the no slip condition, you'll calculate a, a value of force of friction. If it exceeds the force, uh, the maximum static friction co uh, value, then you'll end up with kinetic friction. You'll see a number of examples. Again, please take a look at those. So the next thing we sort of look at are springs. And I see that my animation's a bit off here, but it's okay. Uh, I have a spring here with what I'm going to call a relaxed length. of x naught. If I stretch it, which is the second case right here, right here, 
I'm going to stretch it by distance xs minus x naught. xs is the total distance that it's stretched, and that's my delta. I'm also going to be able to compress it, and here I didn't write my x sub c. There you go. And this will be my delta. Now, the funny thing about all of this is that it doesn't matter with a linear elastic spring. They are linear related. I can't say that enough. The amount of spring is, uh, by the amount of the spring is stretched or compressed. So a force of spring equals minus k delta. So the deltas you see there in terms of magnitudes will be the same. But the two forces associated with this, this is the force of the spring under stretching. So the spring wants to return to its relaxed state. And this is the force under compression. And that will return again to its relaxed state. But it's the directions are opposite. And so you'll notice that when I do this, I write it as negative k delta because the force in the spring itself is, uh, is opposing the displacement. And so that, that is something that you've got to keep in mind and you've got to realize in terms of the problems that we're dealing with. Uh, so just a really quick discussion of springs and friction and uh, encourage you very strongly to look at the examples that are available to you. Um, enjoy, and we'll talk again later.